Well, another mystery solved. This stupid connector that I've been looking for for days. <laughs> the kids were out jumping on the trampoline and they wanted me to watch them do something. I happened to look down and there was this uh, piece of cable with the connector I've been looking for, driving myself nuts over. Just sitting on the edge of the trampoline. Evidently I hung it there to keep track of it. And to top it all off, I <laughs> like 30 minutes ago, I, I uh, did the bypass for uh, the stack match, wired in 12 volts up there to it to uh, get up on my top antenna. So now I'm gonna undo all that and uh, put the connector on and hook it up. While I'm filming this Wednesday morning, Right before work, I decided to give you a quick update on where we're at here with the desk. As you can tell, it's a complete and total disaster trying to put this thing back together. Now this is about the fourth, maybe fifth version of the layout. I've put it together, taken it apart. Just, I just really couldn't find a way that made it all fit together real well, especially since I wanted two radios on the desk. I want the TS-890 and the 7610 up here on the desk. And with the work computer that was over here, it just wasn't working out. And even then, after I, I bought a cheap desk to put behind me back here to put the work computer on, I still couldn't find a good layout. Even though this desk is 38 inches deep and eight feet long, I just really, with a big monitor for video editing, I just really could not find a good layout that I liked with both the radios and the amplifier up here without doing something in a vertical arrangement. So down on that end, I got the 7610 and the amplifier up on a shelf I had built for the other shack. I'm probably gonna overhaul that shelf later, but I wanted to give this a try and see what I thought about it. But I'm liking this more and more the way it's laid out. I haven't had a lot of time to play with it because I've been busy building cables I wanted to replace all the cables behind the desk, the RF cables, be, before it was a mix match of LMR 400, um, I think there was some uh, 9913 back there, there was some 8214, just a whole mix match of different things. So all the low power stuff, the jumpers on, on HF, is all gonna be RG 142. Uh, this is some high quality 142 here that I've had for quite a while, I've had a whole roll of it. I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to use it. These short runs, five, six feet, you're not gonna have enough loss in those to worry about on HF. So that's what I'm using behind the desk. I think it's gonna work out really well. So I wanted to get all that straightened out. So I've been making up new cables. I had to put new ends on the rotator cables because I had to cut them off to pull them back through the conduit and reroute them. And I wanted to share these with you real quick. These are connectors I started using about 20 years ago, I guess. And I've stuck with these. These are one thing that I, I made a good decision on using. And I don't know, remember if I came up with this myself or I borrowed this idea from somebody. I, if I did, I don't know who it was. But these, I don't know if the camera's gonna focus real well on those. Here's a shot of what they look like. These things are great for rotator control. They're a nine pin uh, connector, circular connector. And on this end, on the control cable, on the control box end, I've got a female plug. The rotator up above has a male plug. I left, I made it about a two foot pigtail for the rotators. So if I need to take them down and put them down on the bench, this has about a two foot pigtail on it. And I can just connect those together and test them on the bench if I need to. I don't have to make temporary jumpers or anything. You can just connect those together and do whatever you need to do on the bench. And when you're done, you can take it back up and just hook it back up. The other thing that makes these really nice is in the position that it's at, say I wanna put a, another operating position over on the other side of the room and I wanna move that control box over there for that operator to use. All I need to do is make up a jumper with a male on one side and a female on the other side, and we can add a length of in there with no problem. You can just twist lock, these kind of twist lock together. I really like that setup. 
it's worked well for me for 20 years. I've never had a problem with these getting weather into them. You just seal them up good when you put them up on the tower. You know, some tape, heat, I caution on heat shrink because these, unless you get some really high quality sh heat shrink, these connectors are big enough and this cable small enough, you probably won't get a good seal. So I don't usually use heat shrink on these. I've seen a couple guys on connectors use heat shrink with decent success, but you gotta got buy good quality heat shrink that will shrink down a good amount and has some sealant in it. Anyway, I don't wanna to get too deep down that road. These things are great though. If you're thinking about putting up a rotator system, I highly recommend doing something like this. The only drawback to these is they are a Molex pin. In the body of these, it's very tight for those things to fit. So if they're not crimped correctly, they will not go up in there. So that's something I struggled with yesterday, putting the last one of these on. Um, I could not find my crimp tool. I don't know where I set that uh, Molex crimp tool at. I think I carried it off somewhere uh, doing another project and I set it down. I looked all over, couldn't find it. So the last one I had to do was stupid needle nose nose pliers and if you've ever tried to put a Molex connector on with needle nose pliers you know what I'm talking about it's a complete and total pain now all of these no matter whether I've got the crimp tool or not I do solder them I put a little bit of solder in there uh, just to make sure those things never pull out of there that one I had to really make sure they're soldered because you're not going to get a good crimp with a, a needle nose pliers so I uh, struggled with that for a little bit trying to get those down to the right side size to where they'll fit in these bodies. So what would normally take me about maybe 15, 20 minutes to put one of these together, that one probably took an hour messing around trying to get it right. But that's what we've been up to. I'll pull the camera off the stand here. We'll do a little quick walk around the desk and show you where we're at and what I'm doing. And then uh, this afternoon after work, I will take you out and we'll do some troubleshooting on a couple things. Let's do a quick walk around the desk. As you can tell, I threw a little cheapo desk there for the time being. I may build something later for a better work desk. This was just something cheap that I could put in real quick and get this thing off of my ham desk and on here. So here we've got the 7610 on that uh, rack that we had from the, or the shelf we had from the other uh, ham shack. The amplifier sitting up here on top if I decide I like this setup, I'm going to build a completely different shelf for this so that amplifier has a little bit better place to sit. But this is just for a trial run to see what I think. Unfortunately, I don't have room for that control box to fit right there. It's just a little bit too narrow. So like I said, if I like this setup, we will put, rebuild this shelf to make room for that other control, uh, uh, rotator control and a better spot for that amplifier to sit. And of course, there's all the Shackland stuff sitting in there. And yes, I did get that uh, darn uh, stack match connector put on and got that working correctly. So that's back in business. Over here, we have the TS-890. And on probably the next video, I'll show you a little bit more about what I've done with the antenna switching. I've got this where I can easily switch between those two radios. I'm going to build another um, box for the voice recording setup for this radio. I've, you know, I th I've done videos on those before. I've got one for your, that radio, but I need another one for this radio. So, and here's all my mess of making cables and the disaster that is. I, boy, I hesitate to even take you guys back here. So this is the rat's nest behind the desk currently. I've not bothered to tie most of this up and get it out of the way and make it look nice and neat until I come up with a final solution of what I want. Most of this is gonna be hidden anyway, you know, but I would rather have it a little bit more organized. The old shack, it was, it turned into quite a rat's nest back there. It was always a problem trying to pull a cable out when you needed to or whatever. So I'm going to try and keep this a little more organized on this one. But that's what it looks like back here right now. It's, it's getting there. 
This is one thing I'm not so sure I'm happy with right now. I've always ran either this Astron power supply or I used to have a big, I think it was a G out of a GE Master II cabinet. Great big old monstrous GE power supply. It was great for stability, but it was noisy. It had a loud hum to it. Now I didn't think this Astron was as bad until, you know, I had this all set up out here without the power supply in the desk. And I put this in the other day and turned it on and I really notice the AC hum now out of that power supply. I don't know if it's because of where it's sitting in that desk or what, but it's very noticeable AC hum in here now. When you walk in, I can hear it. I'm tempted and I may do this. A lot of the new switching power supplies are pretty quiet RF wise. That's one of the reasons I've avoided them in the, in the past is they've been pretty noisy, a lot of them in the past. For the last five, 10 years, they've been pretty decent. I've got a couple that don't put out hardly any noise. I'm thinking of using one or two of those and just leaving the Astron here as a backup because I don't, I don't know if I just got used to it in the old ham shack and when we come out here, it was nice and quiet. And then when I turn that thing on, I've really noticed the noise or, or what. It's not terrible, but it's something I do notice now. So one thing I am having trouble with that I'm gonna take you along this afternoon is that four square controller. The controller's doing its job. It's putting out the voltage, I think. But the four square is not switching between the four different uh, vertical elements. So that's something I'm gonna take you out after work and we're gonna look at that and see if we can figure out what's going on with that. I think I have an idea of what's going on, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, it's afternoon, got done with work. It's time to look at what's going on with this controller. I already have a pretty good idea of what's going on, but I wanna go through the whole troubleshooting procedure. If You've never done this kind of thing before and you kind of want to see um, a decent way to troubleshoot and pretend we don't have the manual and we want to figure out what voltages should be going out to our four square array that's outside. So right now it is selected on the southeast antenna and I know underneath here it's marked with a G for ground. So let's go through and see which one of these terminals have 12 volts on them. So pin one and pin two both have 13.8 volts on them. So I am going to first mark down the colors. So on pin one, that's a blue pair. I'm using some Cat5 cable running out there that I laid for something else. I just reused it for this. And I doubled up some of the pairs um, just because I could. So the second pin, and I most likely, most likely this is gonna go blue, orange, green, brown. So orange pair, green pair. And then it looks like I split the brown and Ground is going to be solid brown, and this is going to be white brown. So for the southeast antenna, we're using this one and this one. Hopefully that makes sense. Now let's switch over to the northeast antenna and see what these voltages are. Interesting, no voltage on any of them. So for the northeast, it appears that's probably the antenna we're on right now since there's no voltage on any of these. So I'm just gonna hash those out that there's no voltage there. For the northwest, let's 
see what we have for voltages. So for the northwest, we've got voltage on first pin, the second pin, and the third pin, and essentially nothing on the fourth. Now let's see what we've got for the southwest. So for the southwest, we've just got voltage on the third pair, or the green pair. The rest of these do not have anything. Now I'm curious if you put this in the Omni mode, how the voltages work out. So in Omni, we've got voltage on pin 4 and pin 1, and these two have nothing. I keep a notebook like this on everything I do into the shack. So I can look back figure out how I wired things because in three months, two years, five years from now, I'll have no idea how this is wired. So if I keep notes on it and I suggest you do the same, it really helps things out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this in the north west position because I know there's going to be voltage on multiple lines going up there. We're going to go up there where it comes out of the conduit. I spliced it together there. We'll check the voltages right at that point. So we're up here at this mess. And I quickly taped this up the other day when I was up here freezing to death. On the blue pair, we should see some voltage from here to here. And we do. Should see voltage on the orange pair. We should see voltage on the green pair. Okay, well th that completely destroys my theory. I thought I had a bad cable between here and uh, the office. Let, these all have voltage on them. That means we got connectivity through there. Let me go switch this to where we should have voltage on this one just to double check. Make sure all of our pairs are okay. And we do. So the cable to this point's okay. Let's go over here. I don't remember. This is all leftover hard line that I didn't wind up not needing because the distance is shorter now. So I don't know what I'm going to do with a bunch of chunks of, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 feet of hard line. Pretty unusable lengths. Unless you put uh, connectors on both ends and join them together. So, I'm trying to remember how this opens up. The other day when I opened this up, there was a huge, one of the hugest black widows I've ever seen in there. Oh, let me go grab a screwdriver. Okay, should have voltage here, here. Okay, we definitely got a problem with the cable. It's not the one I thought it would be. There's that Black Widow right there. Come over here and you can see the red hourglass on his, his belly. Or her belly. Not a fan of black widows. So what we're going to do is test this cable over to that box. Now I've disconnected this whole thing from the control box. So there's no voltage here anymore or anywhere on this cable. So I'm going to short out the white-brown over to the blue pair. We'll see what we see on the other end. You know, this should... 
this should be showing a short, which it does. Now what I'm doing is I'm going from a known good in there. I know it's putting voltage out and I'm just tracing this through. I know the voltage is good there. Somewhere between there and here is where our problem is. I buried two control lines out here to this just in case one failed. But I'm only seeing the one pop up out of the ground over there. That's a little concerning because if I do have a bad spot that means we're going to probably just have to lay a cable across the ground here for the winter. I don't really feel like digging this up right now. So let's check this. We got the white ground to the blue pair. What you're seeing there is the resistance. Of, it's measuring the resistance of my body. And we have nothing there. So it tells me one of two things. Either we've got a broken cable or this is not the right cable. I thought I had it marked when I took this all apart to uh, re-pull the uh, wire through, but I've been known to make mistakes before. So all these hard lines coming up out of the bottom of this box, two go out there where the 80 meter four square maybe will someday be. Right now it's just an 80 meter vertical out there. And two go out here to the 40 meter four square. Now I know I buried two control lines out to the 80 meter. Evidently I did not bury two control lines here to the 40 meter. I'm going to look back at my notes real quick because I think I wrote down what I did. Okay, it says I installed, according to my notes, I did install two old Cat 3 phone cables to each location, but I'm not seeing that many popping up out of here. But I am seeing four popping up out of there. Let's go nose around over here some more and see if we've got another cable coming up here that I just didn't see. Usually I tie them up. Now the reason I don't want to bury a new control line out here is there's radials everywhere out in here. There's, and I can't even remember, probably 60 to 70 radials. I'm seeing a blue one here. Definitely another control line there. Okay, I did some digging and found the control wire that comes over here. I'm not sure why I didn't tie it up to that post, but it had sank itself down well, about six inches in there. So let's make sure we find the right one on the other end. And what this is, is just old Cat 3 phone wire I picked up somewhere dirt cheap. So we're going to short out the brown pair, go over to the other end, and find the pair with the shorted brown pair. If I hadn't have kept those notes on what I did, I probably would have gave up and just assumed there was no other control cable going to that one. Out here working when it's cold, you're just tearing into stuff trying to get it done. I think we'll be lucky enough to hit it on the first try. It's not that one. Hoping it's not this really short one. Look at this other one first. It's either this one or that short one. And there it is. So this cable goes over there. Now, how do we know all the conductors are okay? Well, you can do the same thing I just did there. You can short out each pair and measure across it and see if you've got any pairs that are broke. I'm just going to go with, they're probably okay. And we'll wire this up 
to this other control cable before I cut my finger. Let's strip these a little a little more finesse than a utility knife. Okay, I'm just going to leave that temporary like that. I'm not going to solder those back together till we make sure this works. I'm going to run down, connect the power back up, and then we'll go hook the other end up, and we should be able to hear those relays start clicking as we power, apply power to it. If this cable's any good, be voltage there. And there is. Before I did that, I should have put that cable up through the hole. We'll make it work. I'm going to hook the ground up last. Yeah, it's getting a ground through the system anyway, but if you can hear that clicking... So now we're getting voltage out here to these relays. Since it's already got a ground out here anyway, let's go ahead and put the ground on. Okay, I think we're done. Put this box back together. And you might be asking, how did I know that that Foursquare system was not working? Well, first of all, when I put this system back together, I put this antenna analyzer on there and swept all the antennas. Let me switch over to the 40 meter. Okay, there's the Foursquare. Now, between those two marks is approximately the 40 meter band. So normally when you're looking at this, this is on the northwest element, which I hardly ever use. It, it looks like this. When I switch to the northeast, each one of these elements will look slightly different from each other. They're not all tuned exactly the same. So when I hook this up and notice that these were not switching, like you just saw there, now we're on the southwest element. Now southwest has got some issues to it that I'm going to have to try and figure out what's going on there. It's a little higher SWR than I normally see on, on this Foursquare. Normally the Foursquare is really low SWR, so I'm not sure what we've got going on there on that, uh, that particular element. But here's the southeast, northeast, back to the northwest. And here's what all of them look like together in the Omni function, which I've never been able to get that thing to function correctly. So I really don't use it. Let me see if I can narrow this up a little bit. Okay, so we've got this narrowed up a little bit. As you can see on this particular element, it's actually uh, resonant just a little above the handband is its best resonant frequency. So the other way, uh, it was pretty obvious that this, this antenna was not working. Right now I'm on the southeast element. I have no idea where these guys are, but let's just take a quick listen. Okay, I'm on the northwest element there and I just, I can't hear them at all. Let's switch to the southeast. 
Okay, there's my northeast element. You can tell there's somebody there, but you really can't hear them. I go to the southeast. And I, I can pick them up now. I, I can at least understand what they're saying. Before, there was, obviously, when you switched elements, there was absolutely no change. But it's going to be back Southeast, northwest, I can't even hear it. No, he's speaking about an S6 right there. So obviously these guys are southeast of me. I think I got it all there. So now it's working correctly. We're good to go. Well, that's really all we're going to have time for on today's video. We got the antenna working. We figured out what the problem was. It was that one underground cable going over to the four square. I don't know if something ate through that cable, uh, something cut through the cable. It's buried about two feet deep. So I don't know, but I don't, I'm, and I'm not gonna dig it up to find out because there's radials buried everywhere out there. And uh, digging that up would be a nightmare. You'd run into radials. I think each leg of that thing, I wanna say it's, I'd have to go back and look at my notes. There's probably at least 30 radials off of each element and they're all tied together in the middle. So it, it'd just be a disaster trying to dig that up. But that's why I buried two control cables going out to where the 80 meter four square is gonna, going to be if I ever finish that project and the 40 meter four square. I wanted a backup. I wanted a backup hard line and I wanted a backup control cable. And so that really paid off, even though I had a heck of a time finding it. But I wanted to go through the basic troubleshooting to find a problem in a system like that. I've worked with guys that, um, you've heard of the shotgun approach, where you go out and you kind of just do a shotgun and uh, change a, a few things and see if it works. Well, I've worked with some guys that are more like the Claymore approach. In fact, I've nicknamed a couple of them in the past Claymore because they go out and just, well, it doesn't work, so let's just change a whole bunch of stuff. And usually what happens is, if you're not working from a known good, then you're just creating more problems along the way. You make all these changes, especially in uh, today's environment. On the commercial side, most everything is controlled, what, what's called radio control over IP. So you can make a bunch of changes and screw a whole bunch of things up, and it will take you days to figure out what all the problems are you created by doing that Claymore approach. Same thing goes for something like this. I, I knew, I was pretty sure it wasn't actually a electronics issue. I thought it was something with the control cable, but I would have guessed it was the control cable going from that little dog house over here to my, to my shack because I just pulled that back through and I thought I probably broke it in the process. Turns out, I, if I would have just switched that, I would have still been fighting the same problem. So if you start from something you know is good, in this case, I started at the control box, verified there's voltage there, then went out to the next step where there's a junction out there, tested it there, yep, I've got voltage here. Go to the next one, oh, I don't have voltage here anymore. So it's really easy to break that down into where the problem actually was. Don't do the shotgun approach, don't do the Claymore approach. Uh, methodically go at troubleshooting and it will it will fix itself it'll show that the problem will the problem will become very evident very quickly if you take that approach take it step by step so that was a pretty basic system but that's the basic approach to troubleshooting with anything okay enough rambling on tomorrow's video we will show the station in actual operation we'll get this desk moved back and get everything working. There is one change I'm gonna make, uh, but you'll see that on tomorrow's video. Thanks for watching, subscribing, and we'll see you on the next video.